Iceberg Hermit, Chapter 13 Somehow Alan got through the hole and into the cabin. The knowledge that he was home revived him somewhat, and he covered the window with the iron grate and canvas frame. Then he lit a fire. As soon as he had eaten some meat and biscuits and fed Nancy, he scraped hoarfrost off the wall and into a copper pot and put the pot on the fire. After that he took off his upper clothes to examine his wound. He cleaned the torn flesh as best he could with a rag soaked in water, then poured rum over the wound to kill any germs. Finally, from one of the captain's night shirts, he made a rough bandage and sling for his arm. When he was all through treating his own bite, he examined Nancy and discovered that she had received half a dozen wounds. Fortunately, none of them as serious as his own. Her heavy fur had saved her from the worst of the larger bear's bites and clawings. Alan tried to clean Nancy's bites and claw wounds as best he could, pouring a little rum and water on each place where the larger bear's teeth or claws had broken through the skin. After that, Nancy curled up on the cabin floor and went to sleep. Alan filled a cup of rum, lit his pipe, took out the Bible and read several pages in thanksgiving for his miraculous escape. And the biggest miracle of all, he thought, was that his pet bear had saved his life not once, but half a dozen times. He would never have made it back to the Ant Forbes without her. Only for her timely attack, he would have been killed by the male bear. Not only did Nancy refuse to desert him, but she kept him going in the right direction when he could no longer tell left from right or up from down. Surely God or divine providence, was keeping a special eye on him. How else could he explain one polar bear fighting another polar bear to save his life? Utterly tired, Alan gave Nancy a goodnight pat on the rump and climbed into his sleeping closet. Closing the door on the inside, he burrowed down under the covers. Between the rum and his heavy bedclothes, a delicious warmth soon began to steal over his body. He would beat the Arctic yet, he vowed. If it couldn't kill him on his, this last trip, it would never defeat him. Some day he would swagger along Albert Key, just like that sailor he once saw with a gaudy parrot perched on his shoulder and a great gold ring dangling from his ear. There he goes, the other sailors would say with admiration in their voices, Iceberg Gordon who survived two years on an ice floe in the Arctic. And thinking such optimistic thoughts, Alan fell asleep. For the next week, he and Nancy did little except sleep and eat and get their strength back. They were worn out from their ordeals and wounds. Although Alan's arm was still painful, the wound healed rapidly in the clear germ-free air of the Arctic. Within a couple of weeks, the bite wound had pulled together, and although there was to be some stiffness there for months, he was soon able to use the arm almost as vigorously as ever. After he was thoroughly rested, Alan again began making plans to leave the Ann Forbes as soon as the sun put in an appearance in the south. This time, however, he would be better prepared. After the last trip, he was no longer afraid to travel in the dark. Even on overcast days and nights, there was always a certain amount of light. Although the stars might be hidden, some of their light still reached the ground where it was picked up and reflected by the snow crystals and bare ice. The only things that cut visibility down to nothing were the dense fogs or heavy snowstorms, and he would simply have to take his chances on those. Although the time passed slowly now that the sun was completely absent from the heavens, Alan managed to keep busy. He lined the inside of the walls of the cabin with carpet to keep out the cold, a job that took him a couple of weeks of careful cutting and fitting and nailing. He took the mast and sail from his raft and stored them in one of the holds, then tied the raft itself to the keel of the Ann Forbes with half a dozen lines. One day he noticed that the ceiling had a bad sag to it. Having originally been the floor of the cabin, the ceiling had not been built to take the tremendous weight of whale blubber and oil that now rested on top of it. It took him almost a week to cut up dozen thick oak posts from one of the holds and used them as props for the ceiling over his head. When these things were done, he began to lay careful plans for the spring. This time he intended to have everything thought out in advance, 
to have everything he needed with him to be ready for any emergency. He had all winter to get ready for the trip, and if he didn't make the proper plans, if he didn't use his brains, then he had no one to blame but himself. His old tailoring skills were put to good use as he spent days making new knapsacks out of sailcloth to replace the ones he had lost. He even made a knapsack for Nancy's back and tried it on her to make sure that it fitted properly. And remembering his fear that Nancy might be shot by hunters, he made a collar and leash for her. He also made a muzzle out of rope. If they ran across a dog team, Alan did not want Nancy trying to bite the smaller animals. And naturally, Alan spent a lot of time thinking of his home in Aberdeen. He especially remembered his decision to sign on the Anne Forbes. It had caused a great argument between him and Nancy. That afternoon, his trawler had docked at the fishing quay, and he had helped unload the day's catch. Then he hurried through the streets, intending to go home change out of his dirty work clothes and return to Nancy's shop in time to walk her home from work. As he rounded the corner of Market and Guild Streets, he bumped into a French sailor who was lost and looking for his ship, the Jean Christophe. Alan conducted the sailor back to the docks, and the latter insisted that Alan come on board his ship. Alan did so and was presented with a pound or so of large purple grapes as a gift. Bearing his grapes in a paper bag, Alan hurried on home. Grapes were a rare imported delicacy in Aberdeen and only showed up in the homes of the rich. Indeed, there were many poor people who had never even seen a grape, let alone tasted one. Alan gave half the grapes to his mother and sisters and saved the rest for Nancy. He made it to McLean's just in time to catch Nancy leaving the shop on her way home. He fell in beside her and after a few words of greeting said, Love, I've made up my mind. I'm going to sign up on the Anne Forbes. Nancy halted to turn around and face him. A whaling ship? Yes. Oh, Alan, why? Whaling is so dangerous. You know how many whalers have been lost? Oh, uh, not that many. He caught Nancy by the hand. Look, wee love, I'll never be able to offer you what you deserve until I have my own fishing trawler. Until then, I'll always be labouring for someone else for a few shillings a day. But whaling? Aberdeen is full of crippled whalers and whalers' widows. Aye, right enough, it's a dangerous trade, but I won't be at it long. Two or three voyages, six at the most and I'll have enough money to buy my own trawler. And Alan, how long will you be gone? All summer? Until Christmas? We leave next month, the 10th of March, and we should be back by the end of September. If you come back at all, Nancy said gloomily. Oh, I'll be back. Well, you needn't think I'm going to sit around and wait forever for you. Ah, uh, we love. Three or four trips is all I need. A lad was telling me the other day that after two voyages I can become a harpooner. They're the kings of the whaling trade, and make more than anyone else. It's been known that for a harpooner to retire after one good trip. Aye, Nancy said darkly, they've been known to be pulled down by a whale too. Ah, now we love. Sure there's danger in everything. They were standing in front of an ironmonger's store. Alan was leaning back against the store window through which could be seen a brand new plough and an assortment of shovels and pitchforks and other farm tools. He set the bag of grapes on the outside wooden ledge of the window and put both arms around Nancy's waist. We dear, just a trip or two to get me started. And although I'll be away all summer, I'll be around all winter. You know how you worry about me fishing during the winter storms. She pushed Alan's arms away. Oh, do what you like. You will anyway. She wriggled out of his grip and hurried off. Ah, wait a minute, Nancy, Alan called after her as he hurried to catch up. He pleaded with her all the way home, pointing out that he was going whaling only because he loved her and wanted to offer her a better future than just being the wife of an ordinary fisherman. Also, he wanted to be his own boss, own his own boat, and whaling was the only quick path to money for someone like him. Could she not understand that? 
and it, would, it was only standing outside her door that he remembered the grapes. He had left them at the ironmonger's store. I'm away, he suddenly cried out. I've forgotten the grapes. The grapes? Nancy echoed. Aye, I had a bag of grapes for you. He sped off into the darkness, and when he reached the ironmonger's, he found the grapes gone. He slumped against the window and mentally kicked himself. Idiot, he called aloud. Someone had noticed the bag sitting there and had made off with a lovely bunch of grapes. And ever after that night, from then until the day he sailed on the Anne Forbes, Alan promised Nancy that to make up for the lost grapes, he would bring her back a bunch of grapes from Vinland. He leaned forward and placed another coal on the fire. He was a long way now from Aberdeen, and poor Nancy must have given him up for dead long ago, especially when the second summer passed without any word of the Anne Forbes. People would know that the ship had gone down with no hope of any survivors. Ah, Nancy, Nancy, will I ever see you again, Alan called out. His pet bear whimpered and came over to lay her head on his knees. He scratched her forehead. Aye, you're the only one I have left now, you poor dumb brute. And so Alan waited out the winter and planned for spring. By now he had a rough idea of where he was. The Anne Forbes had been north and east of Greenland when she struck the iceberg. For the first few weeks after that, the berg, caught by a strong current, had drifted north. After that, with the onset of the Arctic night, Alan had no idea where he was going. But when spring came again and lengthened into summer, and he sighted land on two occasions, he guessed that the berg had somehow rounded the southern tip of Greenland and made its way north to Baffin Bay or Davis Strait, which was another good reason to leave the berg by early spring. If the iceberg were in Davis Strait, it might well be carried south and by the end of the summer be out in the open Atlantic, rapidly melting in the warmer waters of the Gulf Stream. So Alan kept busy with his plans, getting his equipment ready, making extra clothing, taking frequent trips with Nancy to his ice peak on moonlight days and nights to keep watch. And what he longed to see, even more than land or a ship's sail, was the return of the sun. That's the end of chapter 13. Good night. Sleep tight.